The greatest power you possess is your ability to choose. Join Lowe's more as he reveals how you can begin to maximize that power by exploring yourself on the deepest levels and committing to making lasting and positive changes. Get ready to achieve breakthroughs that will lead to accelerated growth and transformation because you are now tuned in to The Blueprint. Wow, good evening and welcome back to Lowe's Moore and The Blueprint. Man, I'm really excited this week. I guess, I guess you guys say when you come on, uh, Lowe's is always excited. I am. I am truly excited because, uh, I mean, for a, over a year now, man, the guests have been just so powerful, so amazing. And I mean, I've learned, I don't know about you, but I've learned so much. Uh, I picked up some dimes. I picked up some nuggets. I mean, I, I just been excited, man, of things that I've learned uh, over this last year now going into the second year of the blueprint, man. So I'm, I'm really excited every Sunday, man. I can I look, I, I look forward to it. And, uh, you know, and it's a treat every week. Uh, some, some people just think when you see, uh, you know, this happen that we just get on here on Sunday and, and, and then we just, you know, just get on here and start talking. But, uh, really it's a lot of work that goes into it. Uh, a lot of preparation in regards to guests, uh, learning the guests, uh, you know, researching uh, guests, um, even if you know them, sometimes you know them and don't know them. But uh, and then since we've taken over my, you know, my wife, uh, my son, uh, Lozy, we we've taken over and we produce this ourselves, you know, each and every week. And of course, my wife is sitting, you know, right across from me and she's doing all the background work. So I want to give her a holler. Um, you know, I should do it every show, but you know, I'll do my best, but Hey, behind the scenes, she is working this thing, man. She's a, she's amazing. And, uh, I mean, she's just so talented. Um, what can I say? I love her. Uh, she's my best friend. Uh, and just to be doing it with her is just a privilege all by itself, man. So I'm, I'm just excited each week to work with my wife and sometimes with my son, I mean, he taught us how to do this stream yard stuff. And then uh, we thought he was going to participate. Then he just showed us and then jumped off. We haven't seen him since then. Um, he just said, look, you're not going to be wasting my time over here. But uh, uh, every now and then he'll pop on. But uh, he, he's awesome as well. And, man, next week I may have some exciting news for you. I want to tell you about it this week, man. But, um Man, the more family may be growing a little bit, but uh, I'm excited about that. And so I want to jump right in it because we got a great show tonight, man. I, I know you guys said he says that every week. He a great show. It is. It's been an awesome show. So I like to get started. Um, and remember, the you know, the blueprint is about focuses around the seven spheres of influence. Man, sometimes we'll be talking about religion, family, politics. Uh, we'll talk about sports, arts and entertainment, business and finance, man. We, 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 we just jump right into all those spheres of influence, those things that impact our, our, our lives every single day. And of course, it's connected to my book from the Boys and Girls Club to the NBA Life on the Now Road um, and in which uh, Denzel Washington's wife, Pauletta, said that when she read my book, it was a blueprint um, and, and that. Uh, man, I should be sharing this in those spheres of influence. And I was grateful to her. Right. So they 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 excited me. They sold the seed and uh, to this. And and then Denzel Water, he said I was like a pebble. I got a little pebble in my hand here. Not really a pebble, a little bit bigger than a pebble. But he said I was a pebble in a pond. Right. And so each week I drop this pebble because I'm expecting a ripple effect. I'm I'm expecting that uh, the guests that we have on the on the podcast man the things that they are sharing you may be impacted right away but somewhere down the road right you never know when you that something someone has said will just pop up in your head and said i remember that person uh saying this and and sometimes when people say things it changes your frequency and it changes your vibration right and sometimes we need our frequencies and vibrations changed Right. Sometimes we're functioning on that lower level of self and flesh. 
right and we need to get to a higher level which is spiritual right and and so we need to come up and and we need to change that environment when when uh when things are not going the, the way they should be going so i'm excited to be back tonight um and so let's jump right in it man i'm gonna start off with my book of the week man of course the millennials reveal right um by true Pettigrew. and man he's gonna be my guest tonight i mean that is a deep subject as you know i mentioned it before I mean, I, I spoke a little bit about it, but maybe tonight he can get into some details about why he wrote the book and 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 they, but it's a book you should get because uh, I got mine online already, and so I'm excited about it. Uh, and and later on in the show, we're gonna give you some information so where you can find that book out, your book for yourself, and so you can have it a part of your library. Remember, I always say, everyone should have a library. Now my library is all over the place, but I'm hoping that when I get in 2022, right? I'm a in my man cave, I'm going to put a book. I'm going to take all them books that I got all around the house and I'm going to put them in a shelf, right? And my wife said, "Woo. <laughs> There's a lot of books, but uh yeah, we should always every we should have a library in our home. We 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 should definitely because reading is just so important and so powerful. So, but that's our book of the week. And now for our word of the week, and uh let's let's pop that up right now. Uh leadership and all the other attributes that go with leadership. And of course, my guest tonight, man, nobody knows it better than him. Uh, so that's a very powerful work. How many people out there are really, really leaders? Because we definitely need some real, true leaders. But leadership is a very powerful, powerful word. And then uh, affirmation of this, you know, I'm a big Bob Proctor fan. So I, I think the last three or four weeks, man, I've been using his affirmations. Uh, this is the he Hill and Pierce Hopper affirmation, a quote moment. And, and this is the affirmation for this week. It's called when, when you react, when you react, you give away your power. When you respond, you are you are standing in control of yourself. Let me say that again. when you respond, you stay in control of yourself. Difference between reaction and response. So anytime something hits you right away, don't react. Make sure you respond. And then, of course, my music and movie. Man, that's my man, Donald Coddell, right? I am King, Reflect, the Infantry. You heard him on when, when the introduction came on. That's the Infantry. I mean, he allowed me to use it, right? I thought that was the hottest song, so I made it my intro and outro, and I'm excited about that. And if you haven't seen this movie, Man, I, I don't know if it's on Netflix or whatever it's on, but you should check it out. Uh, the Life of a King uh, with Cuba Gooden Jr. Man, that is a that's an awesome, awesome movie, man. And you should you should definitely check that out. And then I just want to do a couple of quick shout outs. And first one, this is, you know, is October is um, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And hey. There have I've known some people. My wife has known. We both known some people that have dealt with cancer. Um, some have lost their life to this disease, and some are survivors. And we want to sh give a shout out um, and and continue to pray for those who have lost loved ones because of this disease, and then encourage those who are survivors. And 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 uh, awareness is the key. Awareness is very powerful. Uh, you know, I, I'm on a call every Monday, every Monday evening. Don't don't assume that men can't get breast cancer. I'm on a call with my one of my uh, study partners on my national call, men's call, and he's had uh, breast cancer, got diagnosed like maybe four years ago, and he's been in a serious battle. But man, he is so faithful. He's a, he. He, he encourages me every Monday, right? But he hasn't walked in like four years, but he's encouraging me with the word, right? He's praying for people, right? He's talking to people and encouraging them, 
right? So, man, you know, make sure you go to the doctor, make sure you get your checkups, and and man, continue to pray for those those families and continue to pray for those who survive. And we just want to honor and and celebrate those who have survived this dangerous disease. So, thank you. And then finally, I want to do a shout out because this is the one. This is a, well, we have a lot of things in common, my guests and I. But the King Movement is how we met, and I want to give a shout out to the King, to the King Movement, um, and the National Movement. Chris Broussard, man, I want to say, man, I text Chris today and said that uh, True was gonna be on there. He said, man, cool, man, that's good. He was excited, and 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 so uh yeah if if you don't know the king movement you don't know who they are go to kingmovement.com right and check it out and if you have any men or young men right there this is starting to spread like wildfire throughout the nation right there's a chapter here in westchester there's a chapter in new jersey new york city and man now they're just spreading this in la san antonio cleveland atlanta charlotte north carolina and I can go on. So just just make sure you go on there and check them out and and uh you know get all the information and detail that you can. And so now without further ado, I want to show you this little highlight. Next week. Oh man, I can't forget next week. Now, I got to say just take uh, just a minute about next week. Right? Next week get guess I have Brenda L Crump. Right? And I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I'm, I'm, one of, I'm always evolving. As, even as I get older, I'm always evolving. And a friend of mine called me uh, about two weeks ago, and he started talking to me about uh, health. And, and man, he started talking to me about a uh, plant-based lifestyle. And, and so uh, he told me to watch this movie, um, Game Changers on netflix and i started watching game changes on netflix i've seen it twice about to watch it a third time and you know we evolve in life right and and i'm trying to evolve and continue to be better health yeah I'm, i was back in the pool yesterday and when i go out for my walk every other day it's between five and seven miles right i'm just trying to be there because you know, my family's growing, right? And I need energy, man. He, he, you know, when I was younger, I had my kids. Now my kids are having kids and man, they over at Pop Pop Daycare and I need some energy, man. Now, you, so I got to, you know, figure out how to get more energy and this may be the answer. So join me next week, man, as we talk about a plant-based lifestyle and the, and the importance and impact of it towards your health right so i'm thinking spirit mind and body so i'm looking forward to hanging out with brenda l crump next uh next week she made me a plant-based uh dinner the other night for me and my wife and i was like what is in that thing what's that what's that stuff i don't know i don't know if i'm gonna do what is that i warmed that thing up and before you knew it man i had wiped that meal out man it was awesome Right. So I'm looking forward to next week. I'm looking forward to a change in my diet, man. And you ought to be, too. So I'm I'm looking forward to you next week. And then, hey, we welcome back Hill Hill Harper. Right. And we'll be talking about uh, building wealth on the 21st of November. That's my man. Hill, man, I, te I texted him and he was talking about building wealth. And I was like, man, hey, man, you want to come on and talk about building wealth? He's like, yeah, man, I want to be on. So uh look forward to him coming as well so without further ado i want to show you this little this uh little video here and then we're going to jump right into our conversation
Awesome, man. I, I you know, I, I got a curiosity question for you. Well, this is my man, Tr True Pettigrew, and my king brother. And uh, look, I, I, I'm gonna jump right into a curiosity. We're gonna have two of them things. We're gonna we're gonna have two, but I I, I want I want you to just, you know, I want to say hello to you first. Hello, brother. How you doing, man? Thanks uh, for having uh, me. Man, it is my pleasure uh, to have you here. And 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 uh, this first curiosity, talk to us a little bit about that the barbershop, uh, you know, because I've seen some of the clips on it and I've seen some of the, the interviews on it. And talk to me about how it started, man. How 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 you got into it? Oh uh, man, what's what's interesting, man? What a lot of people don't know is indirectly, the the barbershop rap sessions is what we call it is what led me to becoming a part of King because that's how I, I actually met Chris. So I started doing barbershop rap sessions, man. This must have been, man, Lowe's. I moved to North Carolina in 2008. I'm gonna say I must have started doing these barbershop rap sessions uh, sometime around 2010. I so what happened is I started inviting brothers to meet in my house because I realized that a lot of brothers weren't talking to each other about the things that affect us. And so I started having some brothers that I knew come to the crib and we would just chop it up and talk. So we just called it rap sessions. We would just get together and chop it up. We would rap. And so uh, Cass was coming to my crib and it was essentially a men's ministry, right? Mm -hmm. Just dudes chopping it up, just allowing ourselves to support one another because I was realizing that that wasn't happening enough. Cats will come holler at me about something they're dealing with. And then I realize another one of the dudes, my, another one of the dudes might holler at me about something that they're dealing with. Um, but then I realized when we were together in a group, those same issues would never come up, right? That pride, that ego. But I, <laughs> yeah. I realized it was like, man, well, there's other brothers in this crew, in this group that could be a greater resource for you than me because I just happen to know this guy going through the same thing you're going through and that guy going through the same thing that this guy's going through. So I, I started inviting brothers over to the over to the crib so we could talk as a group and just be there for each other. And then about oh man, I'm gonna say about two years later, I started doing these sessions in the barbershop. So about 2010. Right. And yes, that was just led, man. The spirit led to just take it to a, a, a larger audience. Right. And so we just started doing them in the barbershop, man, and open it up to everybody because figured that's where cats are convening and, and having candid conversation anyway. You know, in the barbershop, mm -hmm. you talk about anything and everything. That's right. And then in 2014, Lil, so we had already started doing what we call um, the barbershop rap sessions, just brothers getting together talking about things that affect us as men. And in 2014, when Michael Brown was shot and killed by Officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, uh, I saw an opportunity because I knew there was so much division and there was so much animus and, and so much fear and, and angst that uh, brothers had towards the police, particularly black males had towards the police and I saw a need and an opportunity to build a bridge between law enforcement and the black community. And so I started inviting our local police department to come into the barbershop so we could facilitate some conversations and discussions around how we could hear the diverse perspectives that all stakeholders brought to the table so that the officers can have a better understanding of how these black men feel and why they feel that way and for the, the the men in the community also to get an understanding of the officers and how and why they go about doing things the way that they do with the hopes and it, and it was such a blessing that it worked out this way that we would all realize we, we all want the same thing and i tell you man we started doing that in 2014 lows in an effort to build bridges of trust and understanding between law enforcement and and the black community and we agreed that we would meet the first Saturday of, of every month after we did the first one in August of 2014. And brother, we, we haven't missed a first Saturday in over seven years. And even when the pandemic hit, we, we took it virtual. Wow. 
<laughs> that's awesome man um well we're gonna come back to some more some more of true and 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 so many uh, so many multiple things that you find your hands into right but we want to get to know who is true right okay. I, I got a question before you uh, before that how did you you know because i always ask the question nobody has been able to tell me why they name me Lowe's. <laughs> I, i'm asked everywhere i asked my aunt man who named me Lowe's? you know i was early in my life man it was a fight but you wouldn't fight with true <laughs> but uh where did they come up with true man i tell you man it was a, a family name that they gave me that the family name because the the the, the birth name was Dwayne. okay right and then when i was young and the the, the the interesting story is i guess i was um i would always gravitate to to women as a baby apparently <laughs> apparently and, and, <laughs> that's, that's, that's what they told me right this is uh -huh. the, this is the story they told me but i would always gravitate to women i would never like well, like like men and uncles and like none of them i would always I, I guess i didn't like them holding me right but i would always <laughs> gravitate to women and so um and then i and that kind of that mannerism kind of continued itself you know as i got older lows you know uh kind of <laughs> fancied myself as a ladies man right you know i'm gonna go ahead and put it out there <laughs> and so the name that they gave me was true love Right? Okay, okay. And so that was the, the, the name was True Love, and it just got shortened to True. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, I like that. So, uh, True yeah. Love. Uh, tell me <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> so, man. So talk to me a little bit, you know, because there's three main questions. Uh, the importance of family, the importance mm -hmm. of education and the importance of faith right so starting mm -hmm. you know growing up mom dad uh talk a little bit about that man and then um you know transition into family you becoming a part family man yourself so yeah yeah man so i'm originally from baltimore so i, I grew up in west baltimore and B -more. family was family was so important that's right be more be more in the <laughs> building gotcha. and then when you was growing up there you had to be more careful trust me <laughs> and oh, so man. growing up in baltimore man like we, we we didn't have a whole lot right we didn't have a lot of means so you know family was everything man and by the time i came along it was the youngest of of six and then um uh, a few years later, I had a younger sister, you know, my dad had a, a daughter and so I have a younger sister. So now there's a total of seven of us, but, um, growing up, I was the youngest of six. And, you know, by the time I came along, my mom and dad had split. So I didn't grow up with my dad in, in the home. And so, man, I love my mother, man. And both of them have since passed and man, my mom was, was everything to me. And I didn't have the healthiest of relationships with my dad growing up. And I think that plays a role in the relationship that I have now with um, my, my daughter and my son in particular, right? And I was fortunate, man, because my dad passed this, um, this past year. Mm. Uh, and so I was fortunate enough, man, that although I carried some, some resentment towards my father for a lot of years, um, you know, I, I, I was able to reconcile those differences, man, uh, when I was 30 years old, fully, we talked about it, man. And we had a real, real genuine conversation. And I, and I realized how much that had affected me, you know, growing up. And I'm so grateful that I did because now that he's no longer with us, I don't know how that would have affected me had I not reconciled that relationship. Mm -hmm. But uh, family is so important to me, man. And it, it's my first ministry, right? And the relationship that I had with my mom and the relationship that I was eventually able to establish with my dad has really shaped and molded me as a husband and a father. And my family is my first ministry, man. And um, anybody who knows me, man, knows how much I, I, I love my family, man. I love my wife, love my son, love my daughter. 
and we'll, we'll, we'll do anything to make sure that we, I, I am, that I am the best priest provider and protector that I can be, and that we are collectively uh, whole in every aspect in every dimension of our lives. Mm, awesome, man. And so um, how did that play out in regards to your mom and the whole uh, piece on regarding the importance of education and faith? Well, so grew up going to church, right? She 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 took took me to church with her every Sunday, man. Browns Memorial Baptist Church in Baltimore, right there on <laughs> Belvedere Avenue, man. It was right across the street from from Pimlico Racetrack, man. I'm telling you, I remember so clearly. Right, and um, so she made sure that the word was placed in me early, man. I'm telling you, man, when when the word says raise up a child in the way that they should go, and when they get older, they will not depart from it. Like I've lived that because I wasn't always the man that I am today, but I, I often think about if I didn't have those seeds inside of me, if I didn't have that word inside of me to draw upon when I did need it, right? I don't know what would have become of me, quite honestly, man. So faith is a, is a top priority for me. That is the number one priority in my life is, is my faith. That dictates everything else that I do. It is because of my faith that I'm able to be the father that I'm able to be, the husband that I'm able to be, the community leader that I'm able to be, the businessman that I'm able to be. Like it's all of that is because of my faith. And then education, I'm a big believer that we should all be lifelong learners, right? I don't necessarily, and I used to, but now I don't equate school with education. Like education is, is perpetual. We should always be learning. There are so many men, particularly where we are in our society now, there are so there's so much access, unprecedented access to resources for us to learn that mm -hmm. we have the luxury and the privilege to, to be constant learners. And I do my best to take advantage of that, man. I'm constantly reading different books. I'm, I'm reading different articles. I'm reading different studies and my, I give my mom a lot of credit. I got bust to school lows when I was in elementary school. So all of my siblings went to the neighborhood school, went to the zone school, where all our friends went, right? And that's where <laughs> I wanted to go. But I got bust to school. And so where I went to school was predominantly a, a white school with a lot of um, affluent students that went there, and which was not my my background. And But I early on, man, I, I, I and although I resisted it, early on and I had some resentment towards it, I understand why my mom decided to bust me to school because not only was did I get the academic education, but it really helped to develop social and emotional intelligence for me and mm -hmm. understanding how to navigate life in, 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 in the presence of people that are different than me. And I think that contributes to my role as a chief diversity and inclusion officer today, quite honestly. Mm, yeah, I, I can see that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the power of those choices. But um, and but you be more. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, man. One of my our good friends, we, we were just in there. We were just in Baltimore hanging out for their anniversary and just hanging out. And, and we we were actually in um, in Florida um together and uh, he was getting something to drink and he was like man you know give me a long island iced tea you know they ain't the long island iced tea man i'm from b more <laughs> i don't know what they had to do with florida but uh <laughs> right 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 me neither <laughs> i was like dude they got a special uh <laughs> they got a special drink in baltimore that they don't have someplace else but uh he his everything was be more man. I'm from be more. I'm like, I, okay. I, I think I think cats from be more just like saying that. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, just awesome. So, uh, talk to me about being a husband, your wife, and 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 uh, that experience of family. I mean, yeah, because we got some shots here, man. Hey, hey, look, man. I'm telling you, that is my first ministry, man. Uh, Tamika, my beautiful wife of, of 19 years, is is my best friend. Uh, man, she has 
contributed so significantly to, to, to my life, to my growth as a husband, my growth as a father, my growth as a, as, as a man, as a human being. When, I mean, look, man, I, as I told you, I stand on my, I stand strongly on my faith. And so you'll hear me reference my faith a lot. But when the word tells us that he who finds a wife finds a good thing, man, I, I am a walking testament to that. Uh, I, you know, one of the, 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 the things I'll share about her, man, is she said to me one day early on in our marriage, you know, and, and she stuck to this. She said, hey, look, you know, because there will be times when, you know, early on I was, you know, you trying to be the best leader that you can be as a husband. And you don't you're not always certain about the choices and decisions that you're making because it doesn't just affect you anymore. And man, she, the word she said to me gave me so much comfort and confidence. She said, hey, look, I will always follow, follow you as long as I know you're following God. Mm. Man, she said that, bro. But she also knows when she is, she's more gifted in certain areas than me. And she's, you know, helped me to understand the importance of this being a partnership. You know, and she'll say, hey, look, you are the CEO, but I'll be the COO, I'll be the CFO, and I'll be the CMO, right? I'll be the chief financial officer, I'll be the chief operating officer, I'll even be the chief marketing officer. But, you know, you're, you're ultimately you're the CEO, but there are decisions that I'm just better gifted in, more experienced in, that I will take the lead on. But she said, but I'm all, I will always be willing to follow you as long as I know you're following God. And so she taught me the importance of leaning not on my own understanding. And so, man, that's, I, I, I love that woman so much, man. I can't even put it into words, bro. Oh, that's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear that. <laughs> uh, ditto. Yeah, yeah that's, what I, oh, that's all I can say is ditto. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then during the pandemic, which was a, a tough time for, for everyone, but mm -hmm. I, I want to say, Thank you, because every morning, Monday through Friday, eight o'clock in the morning, mm. you and the young prince was up for prayer. Yeah, man, that's my guy. That's my yeah. guy, man. And uh, sometimes he's a little bit late, and everybody, <laughs> yeah, like, you remember that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they be typing, uh, "Where's the young prince?" You look like that. And he's like, "Well, he'll be, he'll arrive, and he'll come wiping his eye." Yo. <laughs> Uh -huh. Yeah, but uh, thank you, man, for the prayer and encouragement throughout the pandemic every morning um, at 8 o'clock, Monday through Fridays, man. You guys were awesome, man. And it was just great to see you and, you and your son just, uh, you know, mixing it up and uh, the love you guys share for each other, man. That was just awesome, man. Talk about the young friends. He's getting big, man. I seen it. <laughs> he is, man. No, that was my guy, man. And he inspired me to do that, quite honestly. That's why we did it together, you know, because a, a lot of people were, were struggling, right? Um, and I would get phone calls to, um, and I would pray with people and I would pray for people. And he would hear that. He would see that. He would experience that. And, you know, and I remember talking to him about it one day and you know, and God had already laid it on my spirit, man. And I remember talking to him and said, hey, man, you know, we should pray for everybody because a lot of people are struggling right now. We're blessed and we're fortunate um, and we we should be grateful for that. But we're blessed so that we can be a blessing to others. I remember having a conversation with him and I said, we should pray for other people um, every day. What do you think? He's like, yeah, yeah. Let's see. He was like he was with it. And I was like, all right, well, I'm going to um, go on facebook every morning at eight o'clock and i need you to be there he was like absolutely right and so he would help me <laughs> identify scriptures well he would help me identify kind of a topic we would talk the night before sometimes and then i would pray about it and that would be and so he was an active participant what i don't think a lot of people knew in determining what the next morning's uh prayer what scripture because it was always based on a scripture as you mm -hmm. probably recall and he was an active participant and contributor as to what each morning's uh, prayer, what scripture each morning's prayer would be, would be based on. Yeah. yeah but, yeah, but he's, um, I tell you, 
he is so i'll tell you what what's what, what, what's going on with this dude right now man <laughs> he is so he's nine years old right and he's been playing he loves football loves football and he's been playing flag football for the he started since he was five right he took a year or two off and so um and then he started he started when he was five he played that year then he stopped and then he picked it back up again when he was seven so he's mm-hmm. nine now so he's been playing for the last couple of years huge football and as you see in that pitch he's a huge patriots fan we were at the patriots bucks game when the bucks first came back to gillette to play against the patriots to return to brady and so right. he was just he was over the moon to be able to go to that game because <laughs> he's a huge pats fan and a huge brady fan but so this guy um the last couple of years, his team that he's on, man, they they they've just been killing it, right? And they play eight to ten, and so he he's nine now. So last year they were killing it, year uh, before that they were killing it, and so his coach comes to me and his mom comes to me and Tamika and says, and the coach's two sons play on the team too. One of his sons is the quarterback, the other son, his other son, is a wide receiver, and Austin plays wide receiver, and so those three. Those three are a dangerous combination. I'm just telling you right now. They would, Lowe's, I'm telling you, we would be, they would beat teams like 45 nothing, bro. I'm not even like playing. And so the coach was like, look, um, they're not really getting a lot of competition at their level. He says, I'd like to bump Austin up to 11 13. He said, I'm going to do the same with my two sons. And so me and his mom were like, okay, yeah, you know what? We, okay, we cool. We, we, we cool with that. It might help him to, uh, start to understand some some humility right because yes. we know in life like you play bro you play the game you're not going it's not going to always be that sweet and so we want him to start to we don't want him to get used to losing but we want him to understand how to have good sportsmanship when that does occur because they were just they were just winning like going undefeated and so me and the mom said okay you know we'll we'll bump him up and you know We'll be there for him when he starts to have the agony of defeat. We'll help him understand <laughs> how to negotiate that. Lowe's, when I tell you, they still killing it in 11, 13. <laughs> 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 uh, no humility here. <laughs> so that, 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 that mission was not accomplished, bro. <laughs> Oh man! This guy had three touchdowns and two picks yet in their game yesterday. Wow! Awesome man! <laughs> yeah, no, that's 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 my dude though, man. That's my dude. Yeah, yeah, I could I could see that, man. Just just awesome, man. So, um, you know, just to go back, well, get started on, um, you get the education. Right. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you enter into your career. So talk a little bit about the education and going to that career and transition into um, where you are now. Right. Well, all right. So I'll kind of give you the story. So I. Um, uh, so after I graduate college, I went to DeVry University, so uh, electrical engineering. So is what I graduated in and I moved to L.A to well after so after i graduated after college lows i decided i I didn't want to be an engineer i didn't that's not really what i wanted to do with my life okay (laughs) so bro i moved to la to become a rapper and so i'm like i'm gonna chase my microphone dreams man and Uh i was a huge huge hip-hop fan and you know emceed and dj'd a lot of the parties in college felt like i had a little bit of skill so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this thing to the test. So I moved to LA to to chase my rap dreams, and you know had some some success, right? Never got signed to a deal, but I'm out there, man. I'm doing shows. I'm making a little bit of money, and when I say a little bit of money, I mean a little bit of money, right? So I'm out there. <laughs> <laughs> but I met some of the right people, man. I was fortunate, man. I met Cube, met Dre, met Snoop, met the you know uh, met met a lot of the big West Coast artists at the time. This was the early '90s. And then I I met a a young lady who turned me on to Converse, the sneaker company, the folks at Converse. And so she started giving me some gear to wear during my shows because she um, had a a licensing agreement with her apparel company that she did all of the gear for Converse. And so I'm like, okay, this is cool. And she eventually said, hey, look, y'all need to really holler at this dude because he's actually making an impact for the brand out here in LA. 
And so, uh, long story short, they end up making me a part of what they call their launch squad. Whenever they launched a new product, a new product launch, a new shoe, I was what we would call today an influencer or brand ambassador is the word we would use today, but we mm -hmm. weren't even using those terms back then. And uh, so they, I, I remember those, they would give me $300 a week, bro, just to, <laughs> to give gear away, to wear their product and, and give gear away. And I'm like, all right, cool, bet, let's let's rock, right? And so I'm, 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 I'm doing my thing and apparently I'm making some noise for them. And so it made enough of an impact in, in the market that they created a position for me at their ad agency. And hmm. Converse was in Boston, their ad agency was in Boston. And so what the role, I guess the, the current day role will be called an account planner, someone that brings the insights to help direct the campaigns so that they mm. make sure it's going to resonate with the audience they're trying to reach. So I, they created a role for me at their ad agency. I moved to Boston, started doing the advertising thing, man, had some success at it. Low, uh, Lowe's was actually pretty liked it, was pretty good at it, did that um, for a minute, man. And decided you know what I, I partnered with some other guys that had the um the promotional company that i was doing the the the, the launch squad stuff with and started um started my own agency with them and so mm -hmm. i now have a boutique consumer insights agency uh that took off that did well um we got acquired by a larger agency so now i'm an executive at this larger agency and i ended up doing the advertising thing, man, for about 20 years before I started my consultancy, True Access. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, no. Um, that, that's that's cool, man, really, yeah. yeah. And, and you know what? It's interesting, man, because, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, roads, I mean, that lead to success. Oh yeah, right. no yeah. question. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't think it's a straight line. I mean, I think there's many mm -hmm. roads. You know, you come up with it. You know, they said, you know, you come up with an idea. You got a thought. You know, you got a dream. And man, we've we've seen people become successful all in all kind of ventures, all kind of ideas. Um, it's and then now with social media, yeah, I mean, it's just no limit to what what can be done. I mean, yep. if you put your if you put your mind if you put your mind to it, you know, and uh, yeah, and we may start out in one place, right? You may you may start out in one place, but man, you you go from an engineer <laughs> to, to a rapper. So so, so 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 that means that you you gonna spit something. I mean, you know, I heard you spit something already, right? Oh, at the, at the, um, when we used to do the um, the, the king with the summits. That's right. Yeah, 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 we, yeah. We, yeah. We, we, we would have our, our freestyle, our ciphers at the summits. Yeah, that's yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, you got something for us? What you got? What you got? Show us something. Oh, man. All right. Hey, yo, low. So I know he got my back. So it's on. Word is born. I'm staying strong. Because I know that I'll never sever the storm. And I know he got my back. So it's on. Word is born. We stand strong. And with Jesus, I know I'll go for long. So let me, let me, let me, let me go ahead, man. So let me. Let me get my mind right. Let me get my mind right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Trying to freestyle for you real quick. All right, now let me go ahead and spit some. I'm gonna, I'm, you know what I'm gonna give you? Okay. I'm gonna give I'm gonna give you this joint called the the the, the, the A rap. All right. Where every, every word in the rhyme begins with the letter A. This is this is one of my go-to joints. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. An attempt. And alternating A's allows an abstract, alphabetician, and amazing arrangement accomplished all alone. Always able and always awesome, assertive and aggressive and always above. Average adversaries and anxious amateurs and the quiet and accurate aim at achieving academic attendance again, again, and again. An articulate assassin attacking automatic, alphabetic alumni also athletic and an angry attitude. African Americans are always abused and accused, and all attorneys agree. Abolish A P A R T H E I D. Apartheid ain't affirmative. Action already assessed and alternative and apologies ain't always accepted. Atomator, Apple, and all are affected. Ask any ancestor alive all about accurate African archives. 
Uh, there, there it is, man. There it is. There it is. Yeah, yeah. I like that. <laughs> I have to tell you, you know, as I was getting, you know, getting older and I, I met Chris um, and he invited me out to dinner. Uh, we went out over there in Nyack. We went to the Nyack Mall and we sat down had dinner. And he was talking to me about becoming a part of uh, the King movement. Right. right. And, then, and then he invited me, uh, me and a, a couple of friends uh, to come over and check out King at his house. And then there was a, um, you know, uh, he had the cookout and uh, 150 men uh, showed up mm -hmm. in Chris's backyard, man. <laughs> and then yeah. and I, I, the, you know, the diversity in regards to age, right, from, you know, my so older guys to the younger guys. And I'm used to kind of like hanging out, you know, kind of with older guys. We're not talking about rap. We, you know, we just being us. And we go there, man. And it was just a very unique energy. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and then traditionally, uh, and coming from a traditional church, right? You know, it's right. Singing, sing the hymns, you know, and, you know, do gospel music and no rap. You know, and so, you know, I'm there and all of a sudden I realized, man, man, there's so many different generations here. Mm -hmm. And y'all just started breaking out and rap. Chris is rapping, you, <laughs> you know, you rap, and then Donald's rapping, and next thing you know, and and you could feel the energy for me. Yeah, it, it it was yeah. exciting. It gave me it gave me energy, man, to to know and and then to hear them rap about Christ. That now that was very, right. very powerful. And also to rap about all the things that are going on in the world, you know, yeah. um, from, you know, from racism to social justice issues and stuff like that. And to see how knowledgeable so many of these men were. Yeah, man. yeah I That's mean, so it was just, dope, right? Yeah, yeah so yeah. dope. Donald's, Donald's dope too, bro. Like, I, <laughs> I love, I, I, I love that dude. No, no, he, he, he's amazing. I had, him, I invite him to come up here, uh, and speak. I think it was at Men's Day. He came up and spoke at Men's Day, and he spit because my, you know, we had a, you know, tradition. <laughs> so it was a little, you know, I was always at, you know, outside the box kind of little guy at the church, but, uh, you know, I try, I try different stuff. Um, my pastors were older at the time, but, uh, you know, I would just throw it out there, man. Let just let it roll, you know. And yeah, uh, he, yeah. he he did a tremendous job for us, man. And he was a blessing. And and uh, yeah, so I, I really enjoyed that. And you know, see Chris, and then my favorite all time, of course, is Pastor Duncan. <laughs> oh up. my gosh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, Pastor Dun Duncan has a church out in Rich Richmond, Virginia, Rich uh -huh. and uh, you know we play ball uh, against each other. And he was at Virginia Commonwealth. I was at West Virginia University, and he got his church out there. And it, but he's the funniest dude, man. I oh, mean, he's hilarious, bro. Yeah, hilarious. He can't rap worth a dime, but he, you know, no, he cannot. <laughs> but, but he better than me, right? Because I'm not even trying. At least he, at least he's out there trying, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So that you know, we we've had some awesome times from from Ohio to Mint. To Memphis, um, mm -hmm. to Atlanta, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. We just had some great times together, man. It's just, just an awesome time, brothers, fellowshipping. But um, so, talk to me about uh, this true access, and um, you know, let's get into some of you know uh, the issues of diversity. I got a couple of questions for you, but not right now. But uh, uh, in terms of uh, diversity and inclusion. And one 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 word you you put in there besides diversity and inclusion is purpose and leadership, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and so talk around that because my word of the week is leadership and and how important yeah. that is, and also how important is purpose as you go into uh, the issues of diversity and, and inclusion. No, absolutely. I think purpose is where it all begins for me, right? But it's all under the umbrella of of leadership, in my in my opinion and in my experience. Because I think great leaders, right? There are a lot of good leaders out there, but I think great leaders understand the importance and power of purpose in helping others to one, communicating clarity of purpose for why they exist and why 
the institutional organization they are running exists and helping people uncover and discover their unique purpose as it relates to how they can contribute to the overarching purpose. Mm -hmm. And so my, my definition of leadership even includes the word purpose in it. And I was such a fan and student of leadership those that I was, I was just looking high and low for a, a, a definition that really spoke to me, spoke to my heart because the definition that I found in the dictionary just wasn't enough for me. And so, man, I, I use resources uh, from our military, our law enforcement, um, uh, great leaders in the world, whether it, it was Miles Monroe, whether it was John Maxwell, um, you know, uh, 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 obviously the Bible, right, was the, 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 the ultimate source and Jesus is, is the ultimate example. But the, the um, definition that I've come up with is leadership is the process of influencing people by providing them with purpose, vision, and direction to accomplish the greater good of the team. And so leadership is really about those four P's that jump out when even as I wrote it down, after I wrote it down, those four P's in that definition are process, right? Which is what we do. It's not just about a title or a position, it's what we do. Right, so it's a process of influencing what people, right? That's what it all, it should always be about the people, right? Influencing people by what? Providing them, so leadership is how we serve those that we've been given stewardship over and providing them with purpose, right? And so those four Ps are really what I lean on when I think of leadership and what I rely upon when I think of great leadership. So. Great leaders understand the importance of the greater good of all, which is about inclusion and, and not neglecting or marginalizing any specific group. And then I think when you start with purpose and then go on to Miles Monroe, as I just referenced him, mm -hmm. he taught us that when we don't know the purpose of something, abuse is inevitable. Yes, right. So that should be the foundation of everything that we do. Yeah, my wife wants you to repeat that definition. <laughs> no, absolutely. Leadership is the process of influencing people by providing them with purpose, vision, and direction to accomplish the greater good of the team. So the greater good is, is an operative statement because it can't just be about a single individual. It's the greater good of everyone involved, all stakeholders, all participants, all members. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Dr. Miles Monroe also said um and i'm sorry i'm just gonna grab uh, um my charger because i think i'm about to and i don't want to run out of juice i know we getting down to the last few minutes and i want to make sure yeah we got run a, out of we juice. about another 30 minutes but I, i'm gonna say what uh go ahead and get that that cord and yeah. uh dr miles monroe remind us that uh the only thing greater than death is a life without purpose mm. yeah yeah, yeah right I mean, and so that's why know. purpose I'm, I'm i'm big on purpose man and making sure people understand the importance of purpose in everything that we do yeah i mean and 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 so um i'm i'm going to i think we're going to show a video and then we're going to have a discussion about that uh video when when we once it's finished okay I don't know if you've ever been to the black barbershop, but you just you just talk trash. And I was like, part of the problem is the police don't live in the communities they police. They don't even know who we are. They just gonna assume we're a drug dealer. Like they should know who we are. I said, you know what? I'm gonna go down to the police department and introduce myself so they know who I am. And I want them to know who my son is. I don't want him to become a hashtag, man. Just thinking about it brought tears to my eyes. And so as I tell the story, I was like, yeah, man, I walked down there one day. I kicked in the door. I rolled over to the desk like, yo, I need to see somebody. I need to see somebody now. So I first met True when he walked into the police department. Now, he'll tell you he kicked in the door and like demanded police accountability. That was actually not quite how it went, <laughs> but that's the way I like to tell the story. <laughs> But he walked in and said, hey, I just want to talk to a police officer. To be honest, I was concerned that it wouldn't go well. And I, I could not have been more wrong. 
And we just sat down and, and literally just talked shop for about an hour. I don't think he knew what he was going to walk into. And so it took a lot of bravery for, for a guy to walk into a police department, uh, into a predominantly white town police department. And he heard me. He listened to me. He challenged me on some things. And he really wanted to help make a difference. Then he invited me to, to eat dinner, and I'm a very big proponent of breaking bread. He wanted to make sure we knew Austin so that nothing like what we see on TV would happen to Austin. So because we formed a relationship, I can call Tony, I can call Chief Godwin and say, hey, Chief, a friend of mine told me they got stopped and, you know, this something didn't go right. He will address it. He could reach out to me and say, hey, True, we're having some issues. Um, need you to step in and step up because we trust each other. I thought all cops were bad, except for the few I knew. Why? Because I knew them. Wow. So, I mean, talk about, you know, you talk about building bridges. Talk, talk, talk about that, um, you know, and, and what you do to help build bridges, um, you know, across culture. Yeah, so to me, building bridges is really about uh, well, when you think of a bridge, a bridge serves as a resource for people to get from where they are to where they need to go to cross terrain, territory, waters or that are otherwise seemingly impassable. And so when I think about building bridges, um, providing a resource for people to connect over otherwise seemingly impassable terrain and in, in this case, I'm building bridges across areas that divide our society the most, whether those divisions be racial divides, generational divides, culture divides, or relational divides of, of any kind. And so that's where I saw a need when there was so much turmoil and, and division and dysfunction between law enforcement and the Black community is and, and I real recognize that the, the gifts that were given to me were given to me for a specific reason that was aligned with the calling that was placed on my life to be a bridge builder, and so that is a uh, that that's this is my way of answering the call that that's been placed on my life. Yeah, I mean it's a, it's an awesome awesome call and, and an awesome challenge, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. to, to, to say the least, and. You know, I was thinking before uh, you, before you came on, I was about 30 minutes before uh, the show started, I was down here and I was thinking about some questions because, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're talking about the cultural divide and differences in culture and stuff like that. Um, but I, I was maybe, maybe and, and again, this is interactive, right? So. If y'all have a question, this is a good time. If you guys got some questions, um, this is a good time to put some questions up or comments. Um, and I was thinking about this. How do, how, since you're a, a, a bridge builder, right? How do we build bridge, bridges um, uh, or how do we build uh, bridges in our culture? Right. You know, we, we, we're talking about different cultures that we have, you know, the social justice, these issues, racism, all those kind of things. But, man, this seems in our in, in the black community itself. Right. We, we've got some missing bridges, man. And how do we build mm -hmm. bridges with ourselves? Yeah. And I think the same principles apply. Right. And the principles that I offer for building bridges is one is listen to understand and not just listen to reply. I think too often we, when we listen to people that may have a difference of opinion or a different perspective than we do, uh, we're not truly listening to understand because if we do that, we realize that what the other person is saying may have some validity to it if we're truly willing to listen to hear them in an effort to understand where they're coming from. But too often we listen to reply and it's what called what what we call competitive listening. You you you're, you're you're listening with the intent to poke holes in what I'm saying, to defend your position, to discredit what I'm saying. That is listening to reply. You're just waiting till I'm done so that you can say what you want to say. And so one of the core principles to building bridges is 
listening to understand, and then seeking first to understand before being understood. We have to be willing to be selfless enough and have more, a, a, a concern for the greater good that's strong enough and compelling enough to say, okay, let me understand where Lowe's is coming from before I even begin to attempt to share where I'm coming from. But selfishly, we were not willing to seek first to understand. We want to make sure you understand where I'm coming from. And if the other person is approaching it from the same, uh, through this, you know, with, with, in the same manner, then it, that there's going to be contention. So I think listen to understand, not just to reply, seek first to understand before being understood. And then make, make sure we are willing to meet people where they are. And we, we say that a lot, and I don't know how often we actually put it into to practice. What I see happening a lot is we're willing to meet people where we think they should be, according to <laughs> us, or, or meet right. them where we want them to be. But if we're really going to be the most effective bridge builders we can be, it's going to require a willingness to meet them where, where they are. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. You know, because last week, I think we, uh, uh, Derek Wittenberg and I was talking about the importance of and power in regards to communication and the key to communication being the power to listen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we, we talked about that experience, um, uh, you know, our experience and why we, uh, how we became successful was through our ability to listen. I think we got a question down there. You, you see that question? What's the question? Is, is uh, what, what, what can we do to break down the walls of suspicion and discord among African-American men? Um, well, that's an interesting question, right? And thank you for the question, whoever uh, posed it. That's Pastor and, Paul, Pastor Paul out of Maryland. Hey, Pastor Paul, thank you for your question. And when I do workshops and trainings with law enforcement, uh, one of the things that I share, and uh, many of them know this already, right? But one, one of the things that I share is people aren't suspicious. Behavior is. Mm. So we shouldn't be suspicious of a person just because of their identity. People aren't suspicious. Behavior. Now, if a black person or a white person or a Latino person, for that matter, is acting suspicious, then that's suspicious behavior. I don't care what the race, gender, background, or ethnicity is. And just remembering that people aren't suspicious. But yes, behavior is suspicious. And so we should be looking for suspicious behavior if we're talking about um, members of society that found themselves uh, in, entangled in their unconscious bias and recognizing that we have that unconscious bias, which is what leads us to viewing people as suspicious. Our unconscious bias simply being a, a, a belief that we have about a certain people group uh, that is different than us, that is often rooted in stereotypes, that, that we've been conditioned to believe that based on how we've been raised, uh, our you know, parenting styles, uh, where we've been raised from a ge geography, a geographical standpoint, uh, 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 where, you know, how we've been educated, media consumption, all of these things contribute. And when, when I say this, I want to make sure people don't understand this is not a judgment or an indictment on anyone because we all have unconscious bias. But that is what contributes to us viewing people as suspicious and not necessarily viewing behavior as suspicious. And it really will require us to address our unconscious bias, one, take ownership and acknowledgement that we have it, know that it's not a bad thing. But if we want to overcome it, we have to be willing to address it and take the necessary steps to overcome our unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're, we're still open to some more questions if you guys are out there. That was a, that was a very good uh, question and of course a, a response. It says, um, 
uh, speak to breaking. Uh, which, which, trying to get that question back up. It says, speak to breaking the silence of being wounded by the issues in parentheses, family of life who are of our young black youth. No, well, well, thank you for that question as well. And I think that's something that's really, really important to discuss. And we need to normalize those discussions because there's so much of a stigma that is placed on expressing our hurt and expressing our pain because we we all to some degree have varying levels of 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 trauma or or adverse experiences there is a a a, a, a study i don't know if it's really a study but there's what they call the aces quiz ace and it stands for adverse childhood experiences hmm. and that in and of itself suggests that we all have them but it's as a child that we learn and develop our coping mechanisms that we carry into adulthood and so the the aces uh, quiz when you take it it gives you a score and that score is a predictor of your health outcomes and your success outcomes and depending on what what you get on that that ranking it, it's the the score ranks anywhere from one to five and the lower the number the 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 less uh trauma that you probably dealt with in life and it asks you questions have you ever gone without food have you ever seen violence have you ever been abused in any way a host of questions mm -hmm. and in full transparency man my score was off the charts i mean it's no according to the predictors um i should not have achieved what i've been able to achieve but but god right i mean if i'm, I'm being <laughs> hey, honest man. that's right <laughs> <laughs> uh so we all are dealing with some level of trauma and adversity in our lives and we need to remove the stigma of talking openly about that because what happens and those you and i have talked about this what when we don't have an outlet for that it becomes unresolved and untreated trauma mm -hmm. that will manifest itself in some way if it's not addressed and unfortunately it manifests itself in unhealthy uh, behavior, whether it is alcohol addiction, drug addiction, abuse of some kind, violence. Uh, and so we, we need to normalize that and recognize that the, 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 the part of our brain that controls behavior, this is what people really need to understand. And I think, I don't know if it's intuitive, but I know from a biological standpoint, we know this, is that the part of the brain that controls behavior for us to take action to do something is the same part of the brain that controls emotion. And so trying to get people to suppress their feelings is uh, uh, akin to getting them to uh, attempt for them to become robotic in a sense. And we're, we're humans, we have feelings, we have emotions, and we, we celebrate what, what I would consider mental energy in society, particularly in the workplace. So when people come up with really good ideas, right, we celebrate that, we acknowledge that, we reward that. We celebrate physical energy when people can labor for us, when they can do a good job physically, whether it's in sports or performance or at the job, like when people physically deliver, we compensate them for that, we reward them, we acknowledge them. So when they deliver physical energy and when they deliver their mental energy, but why in the world do we put this stigma on people showcasing and expressing their emotional energy? That is the, 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 the form of energy that helps us to connect and form bonds and relationships and create stronger and healthier teams, our ability to showcase empathy and compassion and understanding. Mm. So for the life of me, why would we suppress emotional energy when that is the one that is the bond that helps us to achieve success in team settings and environments? Mm. Yeah. No, no, I hear, I hear you on that, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel you on that, man. Um, and then uh, Nate, uh, he says, what, what happens to a people in a society when their purpose is reduced to mere survival. Well, look, 
I, we, we, we have a purpose and we should not allow the world to dictate to us what that purpose is, right? And I think, you know, uh, uh, I believe it, it was said, uh, I read it somewhere in a book one day that says, do, do not conform to the ways of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewal mm -hmm. of your mind. That's right. Right. And so our purpose exists long before we are here. Right. God gave us a purpose. He equipped us for that purpose with our gifts and our passions. And in that intersection point between our gifts and our passions is how we've been called to serve. And that is our purpose. And we all have a very unique purpose. And I, I, I appreciate this question that, that's been posed because we do allow others to dictate our purpose to a means, a means of mere sur survival. Right. We, we allow that to means of mere survival and i'm sorry you there Lowe's? can you hear me yeah i'm here okay so we allow our purpose by the world to be reduced to a means of survival and that is unhealthy and going back to the quote right that dr miles taught us when we don't know the purpose of something the answer to this question right what happens to a people in a society when the purpose is reduced to mere survival abuse that is mm -hmm. Dr. Miles taught us that when we don't know the purpose of something, abuse is it's inevitable. inevitable. That's right. Right. And so that's what happens. So we shouldn't allow the world to dictate. I think it was Exodus 2, 4 or Exodus somewhere between or Exodus 2, Exodus 4. I mean, man, I, I love I never saw this before until recently, Lowe's. Never saw this before until recently. This is when Moses went up to the mountaintop and he met I am, you know, who you are. And he had his staff and and he gave him the assignment. And he was like, look, man, I need you to go down there, get those people and tell them, get their act together. And you're going to get you to take them to the promised land. Right. <laughs> and yeah. Moses said, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe I spoke to you? What if they won't follow? So he's putting all of his emphasis on what the people are telling him god just gave him his purpose bro <laughs> that's and right he's saying well what did they but i love god's response he said he, he answered this question with a question he said what is that in your hand mm. and it was the staff he was like i have given you i have purposed you with everything you need to succeed do not let the world dictate to you what I have already purposed you to achieve. Mm. That's awesome right there, man. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's amazing, man. So just great questions, man, and, and, and a great response, not a reaction, a great response. And and uh, so, um, you know, we got about, what, 15, 17 minutes left, man, and it's going to go fast. So let's talk about uh your current assignment uh mm -hmm. that uh you know you've been given a position um and so let's let's talk about that position tell us what it is and you know because i think it's pretty cool yeah my current role is the chief diversity and inclusion officer for the minnesota timberwolves and the minnesota Lynx of the nba and wnba and so in, in that role, I am responsible for making sure that all four franchises, which are the Timberwolves, the Lynx, T-Wolves Gaming, and our G League team down in Iowa, to ensure all four franchises are fostering the most equitable and inclusive environment possible for everyone to thrive. And mm. it, as well as leveraging our platforms and, and our franchises to ensure we are contributing to the communities that we serve, the communities in which we exist, to address any forms of inequity that may exist for the the, the members of the community and specific people groups. Mm. And um, when did you get it? How long, how long ago did you get it? And, uh... It started this season. I this was season. To that role the beginning of this season. Yeah, I know my son. Um, I don't know if he's listening, but he's he's a big WNBA fan, man. So he's <laughs> under he he hear the links and just flip out, you know, because he, he's he's a big fan. And uh, and um, yeah, and then Minnesota um, now they're taking on new uh, ownership. So you got Alex Rodriguez, 
Rodriguez and his group. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mark, Mark, Mark Laurie and, and Alex Rodriguez, yeah, have, have come on board to uh, uh, eventually assume full ownership of the, the Timberwolves Lynx franchises. Yeah, man. And, and and how do you like it, man? What, I mean, what's what's the experience like so far? Oh, the experience so far has been phenomenal, man. I got to tell you, man, um, the the leadership and ownership of these franchises are nothing short of phenomenal. I mean, the support that they are showing, their commitment to diversity, equity and inclusion, their commitment to people and, and elevating lives holistically, as we talked about before, just really showing compassion and concern for total wellness. Uh oh. He just froze. Hey, it's pretty it's pretty interesting. Technology is so is so incredible. We all know that technology those wins and losses are the people will help us to achieve that. Um, but it's about the people and and this this leadership and this ownership, I, I love that they put people first. Mm. Yeah, that's. I mean, uh, do you see? Uh, do you see? You know, a lot of leagues, a lot of these new these organizations and leagues going in that direction. You, you I, see yeah, that? I, I do. I really do. I see it trending in that direction. You know, I've had some great conversations with a lot of the other teams across the league and conversations with leadership at the at the league level at the nba office and it, it is trending in that direction which is encouraging for me yeah that's, that's that's very powerful um you know as we come to a a close oh my wife says she has a question there is down there it says um can you talk about your book and uh, who should read it and what was your motivation for writing it yeah, so the, the book is Millennials Revealed is the name of the book. And it serves as a guide to help people build bridges across the, the different generational divides and the generation gap. And the, the motivation for it was when I was about to transition out of advertising, I, it was during a time when the millennial generation was causing a lot of angst for a lot of corporations. Everybody was trying to figure out the, 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 the millennials, right? <laughs> and, they, and I realized that having worked alongside this audience in this generation, not being one myself, but having studied them because my role in advertising was to help my clients connect with youth, young adult, and multicultural audiences, of which was at the time was millennial generate, the millennial generation, they were a lot younger at the time. But as they began to matriculate into corporate America, a lot of the same challenges that these companies had with understanding how to market to them in the marketplace, they were now experiencing a lot of angst with how to uh, integrate them into the workforce. And mm. a lot of their narratives and frustrations and, 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 and misunderstandings, that's the way that I would um, position it, was based on stereotypes, just like a, a lot of other um, demographics. And so I saw the, the need to help people understand how to build that bridge of, of understanding and connectivity with this generation, and but then across all generations. So that was the motivation for writing the book is to help break down some of those uh, biases and stereotypes that we had across generations that were different than our own. Yeah, I think it's important to be able um, back maybe I don't know, five, I had been coaching, right? Uh, you know, after I finished playing, I started getting into some coaching and developing players. Um, and and then eventually I had, you know, kind of just stopped, paused a little bit and wasn't doing it that much. And then I got hired. Um, I don't know if you heard of this uh, TV show that was on, was called The Battleground. You know, it was, it was uh, the best one-on-one -on -one player in, in in the united states and okay and somebody from la one and then it was they, they did another show the next and after they had like you know three four five hundred players play one-on-one -on -one, and then they put you the last like uh 10 or 15 they put you in a cage oh wow. uh, with, a, with a referee <laughs> and then you just got to go at it and and then and then they did it who's the best one-on-one -on -one player in the world right and 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 then after they exhausted that they asked lebron james to come in 
and they, LeBron says, I don't do one-on-one. I only do team, right? So <laughs> then they selected New York and, and Chicago as the two best teams, you know, in the nation. And they want to have this, this game in LeBron's whole hometown. So we had to try out 500 players. Chicago tried out 500. We tried out 500. And then you had to get down to the last 25 and then you interview them. Right. And then I was hired, uh, recommended and then hired by, uh, Nike and MTV. Um, I think over uh, 10 million people viewed it. Um, uh, and, you know, I realized when they hired me and brought me in as a coach, I hadn't coached for a while. So uh, things had changed in regards to players, right? Players were different. You know, the old stuff that worked. And I, I used to have to try to find a balance between old and new. Right. Right. And I think that's what you're saying. As an example, uh, you know, baby boomers, millennials generation z generation x you know how do we how do we bring all this together how do we bridge all those gaps yeah absolutely and that's what that's that's where i saw the need and the opportunity is to help people understand how to bridge that generation gap yeah so i mean and uh, how, who i mean who would you say outside of your family uh the a person that most that impacted you the most Uh oh, we lost the sound. Oh, you are mute. Yeah. Yep. So you said outside of my family. Mm hmm. Man, that that's that's a tough one, man. Because like my mom has with such been such a great influence on me. My wife has been such a great influence on me. The young prince has been such a great influence on me. Um. Man. Um. I mean, and then of course, you know, Jesus, right? But that's <laughs> that's but that's family. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um man, let me say man, you know um my best friend, man, Prime, his name is David, I call him Prime. My best friend from Baltimore, man, uh coming up has had I mean, he's been like my 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 my, my day one. You know what I mean? Been there mm-hmm. with me throughout the whole journey, man. And so I would have to say prime, man. Yeah. yeah. Who's like a brother. And that's almost unfair because he's like a brother to me. Yeah, definitely. And and then if, uh, you know, I would like you to speak if there's some parents on here or young people, uh, maybe the parents can relay it to a young person. I heard True say, or some young person may be on on here tonight can you give them some encouragement some you know something that they could uh find themselves to move forward and live by i'll say this man um the joy well i'm sorry no because i'm I'm jumping straight to the joy because that's the part (laughs) that gets me excited but the pain that you are feeling cannot compare to the joy that is coming mm. oh, yeah. yeah and I, I i wish i could tell you exactly what scripture and verse that is but man that has been so true in my life as a parent just so true in my life uh and and and, uh, and period right across the journey that i've been on you know the ups and downs the highs and lows man the the, the pain that you're feeling cannot compare to the joy that is coming that pain is temporary right and if you you think about you think about labor right you 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 know um you you have kids and i know you didn't uh go through the labor yourself right but you know then let's hope there it is right that's a great example (laughs) to get this bundle of joy that is in your arms right now, somebody had to go through some labor pain. Mm. And that pain was real and significant. But once this joy arrived, the joy that this gift brings into your lives 
man, it, it far <laughs> outweighs, far outweighs that pain. So know that whatever pain you are going through right now is temporary. Mm. And the pain that you are feeling cannot compare to the joy that is coming. Stay in God's will. Stay in alignment with your assignment. And that will always ring true for you. Oh, awesome, man. I appreciate that. And um, in our final minutes here, let's talk a little bit. Now, you now I, I'm going to be praying for you. How long you how long you been in Minnesota? Oh, man, I started coming out here in December of last year. Mm, so, you know, so I'm praying for you. <laughs> thank, thank you, brother. Thank you. Because December is about to come again. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, And I know what that felt like. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, where do you see? You, you've been hanging around with the players for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, where do you project? Uh are they no i'm not gonna say because that'd be unfair right because they they're 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 still growing and they're in transition and have been for a long time you know mm -hmm. yeah but uh there was a moment with kevin garnett and all those guys yeah they, they were really doing some real stuff they got some really good players yeah uh, now and 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 a good foundation to build on mm -hmm. um and what do you what do you uh uh oh, somebody's still in my earphones. But uh, <laughs> where do you see them in regards to their their uh, growth process, and and what does their future look like? Man, the future is bright. I'm encouraged, man. Coach Finch, phenomenal coach, amazing leader. Right, he gets it, man. He gets it. And when you've got talent like Carl Anthony Towns, D'Lo, Anthony Edwards. Malik Beasley, Jaden McDaniels, Jalen Noel, uh, Pat Beverly, Jake Lehman, uh, uh, oh man, and I, and I, Nas Reed, right? You know, man, uh, Josh Okogie, man, like when you you've got that level of of talent, man, the sky's the limit, bro. And they're young, they're young, right? So they're still developing. See, amen, <laughs> a amen, right? You see the excitement? You approve of that? You see the no. excitement and enthusiasm that that draws? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. You know, I, you know, I was out there. I must say this about Minnesota. I was out there during the summertime. And it is truly God's country. Mm -hmm. Yo, it, it's... it's it, it's beautiful. absolutely beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, but when, when that winter comes, uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man. So, uh, we true, man. I want to say, uh, thank you uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule. Yeah. I like to talk to you a little bit further about whether or not, uh, you know, the player development things that you were talking about before, whether or not it's starting to go across the league and um you know because i know that we need some of that stuff here between new york and brooklyn and you know different places like that our young these young men right um mm -hmm. you know they they need to be helped uh to develop and they got tremendous talent they're tremendous people and and as a former player man you know, I I was, you know, my parents did an awesome job. My my community, my grandparents did an awesome job to make me who I who I am, and, and of course, my relationship with God. And um, you know, I want that for these young people as well. So yeah, I want to say uh, thank you, appreciate you, man. Let's stay in touch, man. No, absolutely, man. Thank you for having me, man. This has been phenomenal. And I appreciate you having me on the, on on your show, bro. Oh yeah, and my and my good friend Pastor Paul said uh, he or, he just ordered your book. All right, awesome. <laughs> he, he said awesome. he just ordered it, and 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 so I want to say thank you to all all of all of you who join me each and every week. Thank you for your support, and I got 
this outfit that uh Dakota has on, you see he had the little <laughs> goggles on. Yep. Yeah, he is he's big brother man now. Okay. Because <laughs> hopefully tomorrow he's gonna have he's gonna be big brother man tomorrow. And you know, so he's gonna have to live up to the big brother style, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everyone. God bless you and have a wonderful evening. All right. Thank you. Y'all have a good night. Yep. You too. Good night. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Lowe's More, the Blueprint Podcast. Stay connected and follow us at our website, www.lowesmore.com. That's L-O-W-E-S-M-O-O-R-E.com. You can also join the discussion on Twitter at Lowe's More and on Facebook at Lowe's More Jr. As always, thank you for pushing your mindset towards a better reality. This concludes the most thought-provoking portion of your day. Don't forget to like and subscribe to this podcast to stay fully up to date with everything we're up to. Until next time, be kind to yourself and each other. With the is a joke, I ain't buying it like I'm broke. Insufficient funds for insignificant